So um, we, we had a little bit of an introduction to the music of the Yamim no Ra'im, of the Days of Awe. Um, and I'd like to say a few words just to begin. And the subject itself today is, in its own right, a troubling subject. Um, but before I even get to that, a general comment. Uh, some years ago, uh, Chaim Soloveitchik, um, Professor Chaim Soloveitchik, who's a historian, the son of my teacher, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, um, wrote a, a seminal article uh, about continuities and discontinuities in, in, uh, in religious life. Um, and one of the discontinuities that he pointed to was the fact that uh, that was very noticeable to him. Uh, and that is that it's, it's rare, if at all, something that you would experience today, attending uh, a Rosh Hashanah, a high holiday service, and find people in tears. Um, in a prior generation, I remember uh, being in shul on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and certainly when, when the Tana Tokef was recited, which I'll get to in a moment, um, you saw people breaking down or holding, holding in and being on the verge uh, of tears. There was something, uh, I think both, uh, there was a dimension of, of fear, um, but there was also beyond that, a, 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 a dimension of some, some presence, a judgment, judgmental presence that brought them uh, to an understanding um, that uh, life was on the line. Um, and, um, that in, in some very sort of basic, uh, maybe even primitive way, there was a feeling inside uh, that our fate was being determined. Uh, we certainly don't care. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for everybody. Uh, so I'll speak for myself. Um, I mean, we don't carry that. I don't carry that, that with me. It's a memory that I have. Um, now, what, and I think the point is, whether we accept the idea that our life is on the line, um, and, and you know the notion, and it's a, it's 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 a severity and a harshness to that understanding. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there was a strong sense of the seriousness of the day, um, and 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 what and and the encounter, the encounter. Uh, I think Yishai Rebo, in the music that you heard just before, tries to give us a feeling. Uh, for that, for the presence, there's a some encounter with the presence. Uh, how we affect that? Uh, that's not that's not simple. That's not at all simple. Uh, and this year, it's it will be even more difficult. Uh, I don't think we can do it on Zoom. Is my my sense. Um, so that's that, that's the first comment. The second comment is more to our own our own particular predicament. And that is, we recite a prayer called Unatana Tokef, with the theme being who shall live and who shall die. And the implication is that, um, you know, the people who live did well, and the people who die didn't do well. Um, and I, I would just put, not just a question mark, I would put a cross through that this year in the sense that how dare we make judgments about people who perhaps succumbed uh, who succumb to the virus and assume that, you know, they were ne'er-do-wells or sinners and transgressors. So we have to be careful. Uh, that's in general a question that we, with which we have to approach uh, uh, the, the, pr the traditional prayers and the implicit and, and explicit judgment that's part of their, for, their formulation. Um, and and it, it does, for me, it requires uh, an approach of reinterpretation, because I can't, I can no longer read it. I can't read it that way. I can't look at people and or uh, and or or see the fact that people uh, who don't uh, who don't survive or who suffer somehow are suffering because um, they were transgressors, uh, and we know that because that's what the tradition tells us. We're certainly not empowered with that capacity and shouldn't, uh, you know. The, how dare we uh, draw those conclusions? Okay, so that's my general introduction, <laughs> a very, a very pleasant introduction um, to the subject at hand today. Now, Chaim, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'm just going to interrupt you. 
I, I'm hearing from a few people that your sound is a little muffled, like you might be too close or... Um, I'm not close. Uh, how, how's this? I think that might be... Can I see some thumbs up or down? Um, okay, that looks good. Because I was a little bit far, far away uh, when I was speaking. Is that better? And to the... Uh, let me see. Okay. So I think... I think we're good. Okay. All right. All right. Let's carry on. Sorry okay. to interrupt. Just stay there. No, no, it's okay. 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 All right. So, so let, let, let me um, let me begin with, because today we're talking about uh, largely about Rosh Hashanah, um, and uh, we will will I think next week we're talking about the binding of Isaac, and then uh, we'll have one session devoted to Yom Kippur. Um, so, what I want to say is that there's no hint in the Torah at all. Uh, about the unique character of Rosh Hashanah as Yom Hadin, as a day of judgment. The Torah gives us no indication. In other words, all that I just talked about, the judgment and the fallacy and attempting to conclude about people's lives that they were being judged, none of that is in, none of that is in, in, in the Bible, in its presentation, um, at least not in the Torah, not in the Torah, in its presentation of Rosh Hashanah. We do uh, hear the, 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 uh, the ring of some degree of, um, if not judgment, uh, uh, of, a, of a value that's assigned to Rosh Hashanah uh, in the Psalms, uh, where we begin, we, we have numerous times um, an, an assertion that there is an enthronement um, that occurs. Um, and in fact, the Psalm that we recite, the special Psalm that we recite in Rosh Hashanah, Psalm uh, 24, uh, those of you who may be familiar with it, let me read you um, uh, part of the translation. I'll read you from, from, from Alter's translation. Uh, lift up your, uh, it's 24 verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and rise up eternal portals, that the king of glory may enter. This is a special psalm that we recite on Rosh Hashanah. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, most potent and valiant, the Lord who is valiant in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift up eternal portals, that the King of glory may enter. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord of armies, he is the King of glory. And then before we blow the shofar, we chant Psalm 47, numerous times actually. And there we read again, explicitly, so it, it, you know, it, it, it's making a statement. For the lead player for the Korachites of Psalm, all peoples clap hands. Shout out to God with a sound of glad song. Psalm 47. For the Lord is most high and fearsome, a great king over all the earth. He crushes peoples beneath us and nations beneath our feet. He, he uh, goes on. God has gone up with a trumpet blast. That's why we, uh, this is a preface to the blowing of the shofar. The Lord with a ram's horn sound. Him to God, him. I love that use. Uh, it's Zamru Elohim. So him as a verb. Him, make music to God. Make music, him. Him to our king. Oh, him. For God, for king of all the earth is God. Him, joyous song. God reigns over the nations and sits on his holy throne. The princes of peoples have gathered the people of Abraham's God. For God's are the lands defenders, as much exalted as he. So uh, we see that and as, as far as the Psalms are concerned, there is some divine enthronement that takes place. The tradition associates that re these recitations with Rosh Hashanah. We recite in the Musaf service, right? Everybody knows one of the central prayers of Rosh Hashanah, Malchuyot, verses of kingship. On, in the Shacharit, the, the cantor begins the morning service with a chanting, Ha Melech. The king. So the notion of kingship is central to Rosh Hashanah. As I said, it's not in the Torah. We find it in the Psalms. Now, why not? Why is at least this? Because it's we 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 do find some association in the Psalms. Why is it not in the Torah? So I'll, two reasons at this point, and we'll see. We'll go on. Number one, the Torah as a um, uh, as an edited. Uh, I, I like to say. The divine editor cleanse the Torah of, uh, or try to cleanse the Torah of all mythic references. The notion of enthroning God is 
filled with a type of anthropomorphic uh, associations um, and with God uh, somehow uh, it physically, there's a physical dimension uh, to the divine that we are imagining. Uh, uh, for polemical reasons, uh, that is 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 pushed out uh, any such reference from the Torah. It does remain in the Psalms, and there the theory is that once monotheism is established as a principle, then uh, the mythic aspects that uh, uh, refer the, to which the people warm, the people sort of see that, uh, and it, it gives a sense of it colors it, uh, it it gives shape. To their religious life, um, that's a, it, it, it's permitted to enter into the discourse because it's no longer a threat uh, to the monotheism that's been established. But uh, this is a, a theory of Casuto. I generally, I, I think it's pretty, it's a pretty good theory because we see it already in Genesis. I, I, I don't want to spend time on this. It's it's not our subject today. But I just give you one example in the in the creation story. Um, the only uh, sp uh, specific species mentioned are the Tanimim, the cement monsters. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, God created the, the fish of the sea. Why mention specifically the sea monsters? Because in the mythic Middle East, in Mesopotamian mythology, the sea monsters were a factor, were a god in the creation story, factor in the creation story. So Kasuto argues that the presence of Tanimim as God's creation is a polemic against the Mesopotamian notion that they were independent. Here they are, they're, they're represented as God's creation. And there are many other examples of this. So Malchut, the enthronement of God is, doesn't, is not mentioned in the Torah, but more profoundly. And that's why I think the sort of religious discourse is much richer necessarily, uh, uh, usually than sort of uh, merely a historical explanation. Uh, and that is what Harold Schulweis taught us. And I, I look for an excuse to mention this every year because it's sort of central to understanding what Rosh Hashanah is all about. In, all, in the ancient world, the, the new year was a celebration of creation. And the actor, the main actor in the new year were the gods. The rabbis, the Torah already, is pushing for the main actor, the main action to be moved away from the divine realm to the human realm. And this is represented in the choice of Torah reading on Rosh Hashanah. Because you would expect, if it's really the celebration of the new year, we should be reading Genesis. That makes sense. We don't read Genesis. We read the banishment of Ishmael on day one. We read the binding of Isaac on day two. And the Haftarot, the, the, the prophetic readings relate to prayer, to children. It has to do with the human drama, human interaction, relationships. The move made by Judaism, and I can't emphasize this too much. I really can't. The it's a critical move. It's away from a focus on what happens in the divine into what happens between us. And religious life should move us to consider the nature of how we are behaving to one another, not simply how we behave towards God. If I, one more word about this. It's as if God says, I want to give you some practice time. So practice on me. That's what the high holidays are. It's, sent, it's a sort of intense religious encounter. Not because that's the goal. Not because that's what I want you to emphasize your... Uh, your devotion in, in, in a way in which you are holy uh, in, your, in your relationship to me. I want you to be holy in your relationship to one another. So talk about forgiveness. We can, we, we'll develop these themes. I'm sure I've, I've spoken about them before. But that's, 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 that's central. And we're going to see today how that has to do with the individual human. All right. Now, what is mentioned in the Torah? So there you have your first source. You have these verses from uh, 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 from uh, from uh, well, Leviticus, um, I'm going to read I'm gonna, and numbers. I'm going to read them to you. Speak to the Israelite people thus: In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe complete rest. Yelachem Shabbaton. All right, a Shabbaton. All right, so that's on the first day of the seventh month, a sacred occasion commemorated with loud blasts. 
in Hebrew, zichron teruah, sort of a memory of the blessed on a sacred occasion. A memory of the blessed, zichron teruah. By the way, that's the rabbinic justification in the source for not blowing shofar on Shabbat. Of course, it says Shabbaton, zichron, a memory. So on Shabbat, the rabbis rule that you don't blow the shofar. It's merely a zichron, it's not an act. But that's not, where, that's not what I wanted to emphasize. But you, you, I, I want you to see how, how malleable the text is, how they were able to use the text creatively to justify their rulings and to anchor a rabbinic idea in the biblical text itself, even though that's clearly not what the text means. I mean, you have to be, you have to have imagination to be a religious person, I think, I would say. Now, that's in Leviticus. In Numbers, we read, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a sacred occasion. You shall not work at your occupation. All right, so that's the holiday. You shall observe it as a day when the horn is sounded. All right, so that's Yom Teruah Yelachem. So the, the, the reference to Rosh Hashanah in the Torah is about sounding the shofar. It doesn't explain what it is. Why are we sounding the shofar? No hint, no suggestion, at least from the Psalms, we understand why you sound the shofar. What does, what does sounding the shofar mean as far as the Psalms are concerned? It's the trumpet blast when the king is being enthroned. So that we understand that association. But what does it mean to us if we merely have the biblical text? So perhaps, and there's a bit of inner biblical interpretation, let's look at Jeremiah. What does Jeremiah tell us in chapter 20? Let that man become like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting. Let him hear shrieks in the morning and battle shouts at noontide. They don't, the, the translation doesn't help us much. The Hebrew is, much, is, is important, so I'll show you the Hebrew. The Hebrew is teruah, all right, so that's the sounding of the teruah, the shofar, and zeaka. Zeaka is, is, is a personal shout. Now, what we see happening, and here I, I I, 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 I'm sort of, I'm, I'm moving into the essence of where I want to go, is that the sounding of the shofar is already being associated in this Jeremiah text with some human uh, performance, some inner human process. The shriek emerges out of some fear within, some uh, or, or some uh, 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 encounter that we have and, 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 and a realization that we have. It, I, I, and I want to suggest that that notion of zi'aka, of the personal shriek, the human shriek, this sort of primitive human sound, is the interpretation of zikhron teruah, that the essence of blowing the shofar is an inner process. It's true that it has an outer sounding, but the function of the outer sounding is to induce something within us that's transformative and that prods us to behave in a particular, to look, to look, to look within. It sort of prods us to a response of self-assessment. Uh, that's the struggle of the day. It's not about performing the sounding of the shofar per se. We'll see how, how clear this becomes. It's about the shofar resulting in some, ha having an impact on us. And the sound of the shofar in this understanding is not directed to heaven. The sound of the shofar is directed to our hearts. And, and, and that becomes, I think, a theme. You'll see it in a moment in Maimonides. So the, the Torah itself doesn't mention enthronement. The only mention in the Torah of, uh, about Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month, a very strange Rosh Hashanah being New Year, that it's the seventh month, but that's another question. Uh, you know that the, that the names of the months and the whole uh, elaboration of, of, of the months uh, occurred after the Babylonian exile, so there was a, tr a change in the, cal in the calendar uh, after the Babylonian exile, so the seventh month became Rosh Hashanah, the new year. The, the main association in the Torah to the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month, is sounding the trumpet and sounding the, the shofar. It's not a trumpet, the shofar. And the shofar itself is intended to induce some sort of spiritual experience. 
Any questions so far? I, I'm, I'm ready, I should actually sort of stop a little bit here and there to take a question if there is one. If not, I'll, I'll just, if not, I'll move on. Okay. Now, um, the, the cl a clear expression of this notion is presented in Maimonides. What's really striking is that whereas Maimonides in his law code has a separate series of laws for Yom Kippur, for Pesach, for Sukkot, there is no separate law or, ch or, or section of law for Rosh Hashanah. In his work, there is a section, Hilchot Shofar, the laws of the Shofar. And that's a technical presentation that has to do with what qualifies as a Shofar and how to sound the Shofar. However, and this is what's so striking, Maimonides chooses to place his interpretation of the meaning of the sounding of the Shofar in the first section of his law code. The first section is called Sefer Hamada, the Book of Knowledge. It's a philosophic treatise that introduces Jewish law. This is of enormous significance. Number one, Maimonides was careful in how he edited his work. He chose where to place things. He was very Greek in that regard, in terms of order and organizing. And it's clear that this philosophic section is the main, is the main act, meaning I'm introducing Jewish law to you, but before I introduce Jewish law to you, the introduction is going to be the principles that underlie Jewish law so that you know why you're doing this. Because it's impossible for you to be a religious devotee and not understand why you're doing this. It's, unac it's not only impossible, it's unacceptable. And if that's the case, then the law becomes meaningless. And so he is already pr pr promoting this sort of argument and, and understanding that there's some depth to the experience that you need to come, you need to have an, under an understanding of why you're doing this and what it relates to. So this is how he writes about the shofar. I'll read you, uh, there are two halachot that I, that I brought from chapter three of the laws of tshuva. So, so in other words, I don't have to say too much to you. You can just say, it's the laws of repentance. Shofar is part of the laws of repentance. Whoa, that means that the Rambam understands that the blowing of the shofar has to do with some inner degree of the process by which you uh, uh, you you um, assess what you've done and how you're going to repair yourself. So the shofar is about what it causes within you. That's uh, implicit or explicit, it seems to me, in the Rambam's choice to locate this explanation of shofar in the laws of teshuva. And what does he say uh, in, in paragraph three? One who renounces, here let me go down, one who renounces his observance of the commandments and recants his virtues, saying in his heart, in what have I advanced by observing these? Fain would I, I not have observed them. Uh, he indeed lost the virtues of all of them, and by no virtue of the Lord. Da, da, da. All right, this is not our main uh, subject. Then he goes on, and, everybody see that? And, even as a man's virtues and vices are weighed at the time of his death, so are the vices and virtues of each and every one who cometh on this earth weighed on the holy time of Rosh Hashanah. So here Rambam, contrary to what I said, gives voice to the popular mythos that on Rosh Hashanah, our vices and our virtues are weighed on the scale and that God makes a determination of who shall live and who shall die. He who is found righteous is sealed for life. He who is found wicked is sealed for death. And the mediocre, which I get misspelled, mediocre, is suspended till the Day of Atonement. If he did not repent, he is sealed for life. If not, he is sealed for death. All right, so this is classic, classic. It's the basic content of Unitana Tokef. Who shall live and who shall die? Then the next paragraph. All of a sudden, the Raman takes a detour. Not with, oh, out of nowhere because he's been talking about, you know, weighing and teshuva and repentance. And he says, no, 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 one second, let's take a time out. Notwithstanding that the blowing of the ram's horn trumpet or Rosh Hashanah is a scriptural statute, it's blessed as symbolic. So in other words, what he says is, all right, now I'm gonna take a detour and tell you about the shofar. And in spite of the fact 
that we all know that the blowing of a shofar is a scriptural decree. What he means by that is there's no explanation. Exactly like, in other words, he reads correctly. You know, one month's a good reader. The text doesn't tell you why. It just decrees you have to blow the shofar. So in spite of the fact that it's merely a decree, I'm going to tell you why. And what, what is it? In other words, I'm going to offer a symbolic interpretation, which is as if saying, Uru, Uru, Yishenim. I mean, this famous passage in the Rambam. Ye that sleep, bestir yourselves from your sleep. And ye slumbering, emerge from your slumber, examine your conduct. Turn in repentance and remember your Creator. In other words, this is a time for self assessment. The shofar is intended to wake you up. They that, for, in other words, it's not to God, it's not to Satan, it's not any of those reasons that are enumerated, of which there are many that are enumerated, to ward off the evil, all, all of those, nothing like that. That's magic. No magic. It's process. They that forget the truth because of the vanities of the times who err all of their years by pursuing vanity and idleness, which are of neither benefit nor of salvation, care for your souls. He doesn't say you're going to be punished. Care for your souls. Improve your ways and your tendencies. Let each one of you abandon his evil path and his thought, which is not pure. All right? So this is, this is a parenthetic from the beginning of this paragraph until the exclamation point. That's a parenthetic interpolation of the Rambam into his discussion of, uh, of, of teshuva, of repentance. And then he returns to the subject. It is therefore necessary for every man to behold himself throughout the whole year in light of being evenly balanced. I mean, I, you know, it's unclear why it is therefore necessary. In other words, it's a non there's no connection here between one section and the other, other than the fact that the Ramam's placed this in the middle. I'll explain in a moment what I think is going on. It is therefore necessary for every man to behold himself throughout the whole year in light of being evenly balanced between innocence and guilt. Very classical understanding. And look upon the entire world as about evenly balanced between innocence and guilt. Thus, if he commit one sin, he will overbalance himself and the whole world to, to, the side, uh, uh, to the side of guilt and be a cause of the destruction. But if he perform one duty, uh, behold, he will overbalance himself in a good way and the whole world to the side of the virtue, a virtue and bring about uh, his own and their salvation and escape, even as it is said, but the righteous is an, ever, is an everlasting foundation. It is he by whose righteousness he overbalanced the whole world to virtue and save it. And because of this matter, it became the custom of the whole house of Israel to excel in almsgiving, in good conduct, and in the performance of duties during the intervening days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom HaKippurim, above what they do during the whole year. It also became a universal custom to rise early during those 10 days to deliver in the synagogue's prayers of supplication and ardor, ardor till the dawn of the day. All right. So you see the, what the Rambam is trying to do here. Number one, at the end, he's trying to explain a, a, a central issue, which is, it seems to me that wrongdoing is a question that we need to deal with all year long. What is it, only a few days a year we have to sort of confront our wrongdoing? We come to shul and we say, wipe us clean. You know, we are devoted to you. Is that what it's really all about? So he, he, he puts in this context, explains why this is a period of intense uh, uh, of intense prayer, and it's, it's propitious. It's a propitious time. It's appropriate for us to approach God and to engage, uh, and to engage uh, in this process as if the whole world hangs in balance. So what, 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 is, what is the Rambam doing? What, what's, what's he doing here? So, excuse me, I, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I'm sort of continuing what I already suggested regarding the Torah. The Rambam, by introducing that, what, that one thought about the meaning of the shofar, is arguing that the essence of Rosh Hashanah is the inner work that you do. I need, I want to tell you something, he says. I want to tell you a secret. This is what it's really all about. However, in order to reach the people we formulate a mythology about the nature of Rosh Hashanah that has to do with weighing good deeds and making it as if, Dafka, just on Rosh Hashanah, your fate is being determined and the fate of the whole world is being determined so that it weighs heavily on your mind and you understand that you, you yourself carry the world on your shoulders and you can determine uh, what, ha uh, what happens to such an extent. But actually, what the Ramam is doing is 
he's inter interpreting it's an inner interpretation of the outer the outer framework that is po the popular framework and moving us trying to move us away from a focus and a dependency on those ideas to understand what the essence is all about and he understands that if he wants to get his I, his notion across, he has to use the traditional framework. I'm going to mention this a little bit. I was going to mention this later on, but I may as well say it today. Uh, now, uh, I've, 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 I've referred to it before. Leo Strauss wrote a famous article. He was a professor of political philosophy at the University of Chicago, a German refugee who wrote a, 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 a and, and who had a hand in the translation of The Guide of the Perplexed. Um, and um, he, uh, he, he wrote an essay called Persecution and the Art of Writing. And in this essay, he talks about how philosophers learned after Socrates to couch their true notions uh, in, uh, in a hidden way so that they were able to communicate the idea without undoing what, what, what the people may have thought in a, in, in, in a graphic way. So as to not to draw too much attention to the fact that they were changing the discourse. So Rambam wants to change the discourse. And he wants to, even though he knows that's what the Talmud says, that's what the prayers say, that's what people believe, that it's a judgment day, and the judgment is being made by God, and it's as if, and your fate is being determined by how you behave. And he wants to get us beyond that to some process that, with, that we take seriously in terms of how we're going to reconstitute ourselves. Now, there are implications to this I'm, that I'm going to get to, but I want to draw another source in order to, in order to make the point, I think, in order to, to sort of emphasize, emphasize the point. So the myth is the popular presentation for the people. The inner interpretation that the shofar is a wake-up call for something that goes on within us, that's, that's the real understanding. And in the guide, the Rambam talks about what he calls necessary opinions, and correct opinions. So the necessary opinion, which was necessary to uh, play into the traditional understanding, is who shall live and who shall die. The correct opinion is we are the ones who determine by, by virtue of our behavior. All right, now we'll see more about this. I wanted to point out, before I take some questions, this uh, source um, uh, the Ololot Ephraim. The Ololo, unfortunately, I don't have a, an English translation um, next year. I'll make it English. Maybe. I'll hope. I'll try. Uh, the Ololot Ephraim um, is a, um, uh, uh, was written by Rabbi Ephraim of Lunschut. He was a rabbi in Prague after Rabbi Lowy in the, in the 17th century. Uh, he was a very famous preacher. Uh, and uh, among other things, he took on the wealthy class in, in Prague, he wasn't that popular. He was extremely critical uh, of their spending, of their mansion-like dwellings. In other words, as, as, in contrast to rabbis today, I mean, he spoke out, and, he, and we have a record of the sermons and the interactions and so on. And he wrote a commentary on the Torah called Kliakar, a very popular commentary, which draws a, a lot of midrashim. And he wrote a, a volume on the, on the life cycle and holidays called Ololot Ephraim. Um, the, 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 the uh, saplings, uh, or the lot, no, it's actually the seedlings, I'm sorry, the seedlings of Ephraim. So it happens that uh, I, I had, I, it's, a, it's a book that's, that, that means a lot to me, that uh, it's a popular book. So I had my grand, I had, I've had my grandfather's copy um, uh, all, uh, for, many, for many years. Uh, his, uh, his copy was printed at Amsterdam. I don't know, I don't know if you see, do you see this on the screen? Uh, Giselle, do people see the, uh, can you see the, the, yeah, you see it. Yes, yeah. I can see it. Yeah, so this volume was published in Amsterdam in 1770. I mean, one of the pleasures in life is that I get a chance to learn in, in, in Svarim in books that were owned by my, my, my grandfather. Uh, the, the, the uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I can't, I, I can't study them with him, uh, which, which would have been a great privilege. Um, but uh, in, in recent years, uh, I was also able to acquire um, the, the first edition of the Olavut Ephraim, which was actually printed in, printed in Prague and printed in, in, in 1590. Uh, so this is, a, this is an, er, an early work. And, and this is what 
you know, this is what it looks like here. If you want, I think if you want to see, this is this is the title page of the work yeah. from from Prague, um, and and this is this is the text, um, and and it follows the holidays and and the and, and the life cycle, um, and you know it it, it it it's a preacher's it's a it, it's it's a preacher's preaching and a guidebook. Uh, it seems to me for rabbis in terms of its the richness uh, of, of the material. So if you look here at this second paragraph, I'm going to read it and translate just a few lines for you, not this whole section. But here, Hakdamat inyan the introduction to this matter, humutal al kolchai asher chelik asher chalak lo elohim bebina. So uh, it, it's imposed on everyone who's cre uh, who, 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 to whom God gave understanding. So all of you, you all have this obligation. Lachkar achare devarim shehelima otam hatora lamaze. This is the main sort of puzzle, right? Why is it? Why is it that the Torah hid from us? the significance of Rosh Hashanah. It tells us what Pesach is about. It tells us what Yom Kippur is about. Right? It didn't tell us what Rosh Hashanah is about. What, what, what's going on here? Lama zeh. Lama zeh matzinu. Bepartut he'elem zeh. This omission. Bishnei Zamanim in two times, not just Rosh Hashanah, Asher Lahem Mishpat HaBechora. Two holidays, Shnei Zamanim, two seasons, two holidays that have a, 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 that, uh, that, are, that have a priority. Vahareshit, and, and are first, right, first. Vahem, and they are Yom Matan Torah, the Yom Teruah Zeh. That is, one is Shavuot. It doesn't tell us when Shavuot is. It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us uh, that the Torah was given on Shavuot. Right? It's completely missing, and also we don't we don't know what the meaning is of Rosh of, of Rosh Hashanah. In fact, what's hidden from us? What's hidden? What phrase doesn't appear in the Torah regarding Rosh Hashanah? Anybody? You can unmute yourselves if, if someone has an answer. What phrase that we would that's absolutely essential to understanding in, a, in the most basic level? What's what's the next? What's that? Teshuvah. Uh, teshuvah, yes. To, but I mean about the uh, about the about the day. The the the, the, the name. isn't mentioned, but the phrase Rosh Hashanah isn't mentioned. No, we don't have a name to the holiday. Yom Teruah. All there's a day of blowing the shofar. So here, you, everyone, oh, it's Rosh Hashanah. What do you mean it's Rosh Hashanah? The Torah doesn't say it's Rosh Hashanah. This is what he's talking about. Not only is the, not only is the meaning hidden, the name is hidden. We have, we have no idea what it is. It's, it's all omitted. All right? So what he says, let's look in the bottom here. So he says, Vahatam, those of you who are following in the Hebrew, Vahatam, Shabakula Mecharu. The answer for all these questions is one. I mean, this, this is the good Darshan, uh, the good homileticist. He asks a number of questions and he ties it all together, you know, brings it all home. Kedei Shiyeh Adam, listen to this. Kedei Shiyeh Adam Mesupak Bechol Yom. Shema Zehu Hayom. Vinim Shach Mimenu Toelet Kadol. So that you should have a doubt every day. Maybe this is the day. And the, what we draw from this is enormous benefit. So Rabbi, you, where does it say Yom Hadin? It doesn't, Yom Hadin? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's the whole point. It doesn't call it Yom Hadin, and it doesn't call it, it's all in the Talmud. It doesn't call it, it doesn't call it, it, it Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is in the Mishnah. Until we don't have, in other words, I, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure, I, I, one would have to check, check the Qumran, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't think that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're, it's called Rosh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But, um, but certainly in the Torah, it's not, it's not. So, so first he gives the answer regarding Shavuot. 
why in Shavuot is it hidden, and we don't know the we don't know that it's the day of the giving of the Torah, so that you should doubt, so you should think it's every day. Why? Ki yom matan Torah. Uh, what's that? Nechuse uh, is hidden. Kadei shamaskil tiyeh tiyeh Torah beina bechol yom kiprakmatya chadasha keinu hayom kibla. Why don't we have uh, Shavuot designated as a day of the giving of the Torah and the receipt of the Torah, so that every day you should feel as if you're receiving it anew, and every day it should be to you as if you are renewing it. So learning is not something that occurs on one day. In other words, the Torah wasn't given on a day. The Torah is given every day. And that's what he says is true here. The chain so too, the idea that this is the day of judgment is hidden for this reason. They shouldn't know the set and designated time. And then people will just gather up sins all year long. And they'll think, all right, we're sinners all year long, and then on the day of judgment, we'll do tshuva. There's no such thing. And I, I, really, if, if you want, if you want, really want to sort of dig all the way into this understanding, he's saying there's no Yom Adin. There's no Day of Judgment. Every day you have to imagine yourself and assess where you are. There's no magical cleansing that occurs because one day a year you revive yourself. I know that in some ways it punctures a myth. And uh, in, in some I, I think maybe it's, it, maybe it's difficult to assimilate. We look forward to the new year for a sense of renewal, of course. But maybe we should look forward to the new year as a reminder that we sh should renew ourselves every day of the year, or try to. It's an enormous discipline. It's unbelievably difficult, impossible, absolutely. But a consciousness of the fact that there's no magical bullet that we somehow, ah, we come to Shul and Yom Kippur, everything is clean and we're white and so on and so forth. The work needs to be done constantly and that's grueling labor. It's inner, it's inner labor. It's what the shofar is all about. It's about the inner work. So that, so Lanshitz is really gets to the heart of understanding what the Rambam has already told us. That the mythology is there because that's the, to the popular mind, that's the framework with which we understand the severity of the day of judgment. And, it's, and, it, and there's nothing wrong with having that as the frame. What's wrong is relying on that uh, 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 as being the essence. The essence requires that you go beyond the frame into the inner aspects of the process of what you're engaging in, in the prayer and in the whole ritual of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur so that it has an impact on your life. Look at the next line on the next page. It's also in Hebrew, but it's from the Rambam's Commentary on the Mishnah and Rosh Hashanah. So the Mishnah and Rosh Hashanah says that um, the all all creations. See, this is this is the the tradition that we know pass before God in judgment, and we recite that in in the in in the Unetan Tokif, Kol Ba'e Olam, all of God's creations, Yavrun Lefanecha, pass before you, Kivnei Maron, and the Talmud doesn't understand what Kivnei Maron. So one interpretation of Neymaron is like sheep. So the Rambam quotes this, Hatzon, Targum, Kvas, etc., etc. All right, so let's not read this whole, this whole section here. And he says that it's about, you know, we pass before God and our fate is determined who will live, who will be healthy, who will be sick, uh, etc., etc. And Vahaniglemi Zehamama Mivuar. And what's revealed in this teaching is, is explained. And everybody knows that. Kasher Tereh. And you see it in the Talmud, he says. No problem. Aval. Listen to the language of the Rambam. Hanistar. What's hidden in Yano Kashem Ma'od, believe so. What's hidden, its matter is very difficult, without a doubt. So the Rambam understands that he's undermining a classical basis for Rosh Hashanah or understanding of Rosh Hashanah with an innovative uh, inner meaning that suggests something that's that's uh, a, a, a hidden dimension in the in the uh, in the more in the authoritative text 
of Rambam's commentary that was translated um, um, by Rabbi Kafich, who's a, a Yemenite scholar who translated it from the Arabic. Of course, the Rambam wrote his commentary on the Mishnah in Arabic. His, his law code he wrote in Hebrew. It was the only work that he wrote in Hebrew. Uh, everything else he wrote in Judeo-Arabic. So the translation, he translates the Judeo-Arabic, not nistar, but sodo. It's secret. It's secret. So the question is, so what's the secret? The secret is uru-uru, that it's an inner process. It's not an external process, even though the Talmud, even though the tradition itself emphasizes when it's a tokef, that it's an outer process, who shall live and who shall die, that's not, what, that's not what's happening. And we'll be able to go, go, go a little further. We, ha we have more to do. But in the meantime, let me take a break. Any questions? Any questions up till now? Everything is clear? OK. Now. What I, what I like to point out is how Jewish law expresses Jewish philosophy. Usually we not, usually, I mean, this is, this, is based, this is one of the things I learned from Robert Soloveitchik and from David Hartman. Uh, not to think of Jewish law as a bunch of regulations. Jewish law, I, I sometimes call it philosophy in action. In other words, these are behaviors that reflect principles and ideas, if not, if not philosophic principles, ideas. So the Rambam's formulation, it's actually the Talmud's understanding. And he, so he, he, he gets it. It's just that he, he runs with it all the way. So he, he defines the nature of what the, what the act of blowing the shofar is. Now this is in the laws of shofar, not in the laws of tshuva, where he describes the, the actual uh, sounding of the shofar. And he says, hakol chayavin, I'm sorry that I omitted the translation of this line. Lishmoa kol shofar. All are obligated to hear the sound of the shofar. There's no mitzvah to blow the shofar. The mitzvah on Rosh Hashanah is to hear the shofar. That's why. Why? Because you have to take the sound in. Because the sound is supposed to have an impact on you, on your heart, on your being. It's supposed to unsettle you in some way, not the divine. Hakol chayavim nishmoa kol shofar. God isn't obligated to listen to the shofar. We're obligated to hear the shofar. And then he then he provides the law. We'll just read this one one paragraph in the, uh, not the next one. One who is practicing blowing the shofar to teach himself has not fulfilled his obligation. Why? Why? Right. And, and, and likewise, one who hears the shofar from one practicing has not fulfilled his obligation. If the hearer of the shofar had intent to fulfill his obligation, but the blower did not have intent to be his agent, or if the blower had intent to be his agent, but the hearer did not have intent to fulfill his obligation, he has not fulfilled his obligation until both the hearer and the sounder have intent. Wow. I thought that laws are meant to be that to be acted on, right? Where, where the, if you eat uh, on Pesach, and the Ramam quotes this as a law, if you eat matzah on Pesach, it doesn't matter what intent you have, you have fulfilled the obligation of eating matzah on Pesach. So how come for shofar, he requires intent? Obviously, he understands the Talmud. There's a Talmudic discussion, but he pushes in this direction. I mean, there's an argument in the Talmud. He pushes in the direction because the intention is the essence of the shofar blowing itself. And I would formulate it as follows, because this is what's important. It's not that blowing the shofar requires intention. Blowing the shofar is intention. It must be intention. In other words, the act is intention. If, it's, if the act is not intention, it's merely an act. The only thing that makes sense is that you are sounding something in, in, in your insides and you're experiencing it and you feel it and you understand it as you blow the shofar. It's not something outside of the blowing. The blowing and the intention need to be coextensive. Let's put it that way. And that's, that becomes the rule for the kavana. That's what we call kavana. So shofar, blowing doesn't require kavana, shofar blowing is kavana. It's exactly the way the Rambam talks about prayer. Prayer doesn't require intention. Prayer is 
intention. And without intention, there's no prayer. There are, what, what is there? There are words. Without intention, there's no shofar blowing. There's a sound. Blow the trumpet. Sound, you know, join the band. But bring to the sounding of the shofar a degree of concentration. I mean, it, I think about this in terms of your prayer this year, especially since I think that most, most of you are going to be at home. One of the advantages of being at home is take your time. I mean, I, 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 mean, I actually see it as, you know, I, I'm not all that comfortable with, in, in a community of prayer. They rush you, you have to finish. You don't have to say it all, right? You don't have to say it all. But the exp you should be concentrating and thinking about what, are, what, what, what elements, what dimensions, what, what behaviors do I need to work on this year? And especially this year in light of what we're seeing, what actions am I going to take? I mean, we have a, a, a great opportunity. We also have an opportunity to study. Make sure, get yourself a good book. Jonathan Sachs just published a new book on morality. Buy a book for Rosh Hashanah and devote the time of the service in part to read the book. I always tell people anyway to bring a book to shul because, you know, it, 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 it is possible sometimes that the rabbi sermon could be boring. I, I know it's not likely, but, um, but in other words, take advantage. Take advantage of your time. And, 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 and especially uh, to, to be able to do sort of the, the, this inner work. So um, the Rambam, Rabbi. yes, please. Yes, yes please. Um, this particular paragraph, oh, you just took it off. No, no, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Here it is. Oh, uh, what, what, can we go? I'm not hearing you. Can to Hamid, mit kaven, mit lamed. Can we go to back to that paragraph for a moment before we leave it? We just left yes. it. It's the one up here. Here it is. Oh, anyhow, it's the first. Uh, there it is. Yes. Okay, it's the first time that I come across, unless I'm Hamid uh, take unless I'm um, mistaken. I have never seen these words in the Hifiel form before. Hamid Tasek, Lahit Lamed. They're so interesting for me because it's the first time I've come across them uh -huh. and it kind of excites me because they're taking a word and using it. Uh, on, it has to do with oneself that's involved. Therefore, one who is listening to someone prepare the shofar is not fulfilling the mitzvah unless they hear the shofar in the context of the real tefillah. Am well, I correct or well, incorrect? Uh, right, well, unless about that. Hear it in the context, in the context. In other words, just hearing someone far nitkaven shomea is not doing his chavato. He is not fulfilling his chavato. Correct. It, it's insufficient. That's what the paragraph. It's insufficient. It requires yeah. that there be intentionality, that there be the notion that I'm, I'm bringing the Hello, sound. Rabbi? Yes. Yes. Yes, Mimi. Yeah. Do you want to say something else? Okay. He's frozen. All right. Okay, it's okay. All right. So let me conclude here the following, this section. The Rambam's project was a project of demythologization. He wanted to move Judaism away from merely being a public religious performance. He wanted to move it away from the platform of what we call popular religion and give everybody an opportunity for a, a more sophisticated insight. Not because everybody was an intellectual, but everybody should have the opportunity to reflect on what they're doing. Different people will do it at a different level. However, he was enough of a communally oriented person to say, to, to, to frame the inner process within the popular process, so at least he, he, he gives voice to it 
so that people, some people, will enter into this world through the popular understanding. But my hope is, and my goal is, they move beyond the popular understanding to understand what the, what the essence is all about. Now, the halachic notion was already articulated a couple of generations before the Rambam by the teacher of the Rambam's father's teacher, Rabbeinu Hananel, who headed up the yeshiva in Kerwan, uh, in what is uh, Tunisia today. Uh, there was a famous center of Jewish learning uh, in, in Kerwan, and R- Rabbeinu Hananel has a running commentary on the, on the side of the Talmud, or certain tractates of the Talmud, and he says, I want you to hear that phrase, because it's actually more poignant than the Rambam. With regard to the sounding of the shofar, it requires the intention of the heart. That's exactly, exactly the phrase that's used for prayer. What's the phrase in prayer? To worship God with all your heart. The Talmud says, What's the worship of the heart? That's what prayer is. All right? So this is um, a, 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 a more profound understanding of the sounding of the shofar. Now, in further evidence about the nature of Rosh Hashanah, I just wanted to, and this is just for a couple of minutes, I wanted you to see how Rosh Hashanah was celebrated at the end of the sec- at the end of the first temple, or at the beginning, if- after the destruction of the first temple, when the Jews returned from Babylonia, Ezra and Nehemiah. So look look at look at the celebration here in 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 Nehemiah. The entire people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate in Jerusalem, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the scroll of the teaching of Moses with which the Lord had charged Israel on the first day of the seventh month. Also, you see here, it's not called Rosh Hashanah. Ezra the priest brought the teaching before the congregation, men and women, all who could listen with understanding. They read from the scroll of the teaching of God, translating it and giving the sense so they understood the reading. Very important. Everybody see this verse? What did the rabbis do? Not the rabbis. I'm sorry, what did Ezra do? Ezra Ezra was before the rabbis. He read the Torah and he interpreted it. You can't read the Torah you need to interpret the Torah. We don't read the Torah, we understand it. It's not sufficient to read the Bible, right? So when there was this public, there's a public ceremony. At the public ceremony, which was a type of recovenanting ceremony that was engaged in by Ezra and Nehemiah in Jerusalem in a public, uh, on the first of the seventh month, they read and they interpreted the text. Nehemiah the Tirshata, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were explaining, explaining to the people, said to the, all the people, This day is holy to the Lord, your God. You must not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping as they listened to the words of the teaching. He further said to them, Go, eat choice foods, and drink sweet drinks, and send portions to whoever has not, nothing prepared, for the day is holy to our Lord. Do not be sad, for your rejoicing the Lord is the source of your strength. The Levites were quieting the people, saying, Hush, for the day is holy. Do not be sad. Then all the people went to eat and drink and send portions and make merriment, for they understood the things they were told. So what do you you see here? This is a picture into into antiquity. Nobody knew the idea that Rosh Hashanah and Kippur was a time in which we were confronted with death and mourning and fear, not mentioned at all. In fact, what... This is a polemic. Ezra is telling the people, don't do like the Babylonians, who on their New Year's Day are frightened because the gods are around and the gods are ruling. So they hide because of that. No need to hide. No need to mourn. This is a day of celebration, of renewal, of opportunity, not of mourning, not of sadness. Okay, so there you have already biblical biblical evidence. And again, Rosh Hashanah, not mentioned. Now, the Talmud, just to go a little bit further, the Talmud says as follows in Tractate Rosh Hashanah. There's a long discussion and argument. We'll see this in two sections. The Gemara explains, as it is taught in a Baraita, all are judged on Rosh Hashanah, and they're sentenced to seal on Yom Kippur. Right? We all know that. This is a statement of Rabbi Meir. But that's only what Rabbi Meir thinks. 
Rabbi Yehuda says, all are judged on Rosh Hashanah, and their sentence is sealed each in its own time. On Passover, the sentence is sealed concerning grain. On Shavuot, concerning fruits that grow on a tree. On the festival of Sukkot, they are judged concerning water. And mankind is judged on Rosh Hashanah, and the sentence is sealed on Yom Kippur. Okay, so that's his elaboration of Rabbi Meir. Now, but we have another opinion. Rabbi Yossi says, a person is judged every day, and not just once a year. As it is stated, you visit him every morning, meaning that every morning an accounting is made and a judgment is passed. Rabbi Nathan Natan says, a person is judged every hour. As it is stated, you try him every moment. Now, who makes those judgments? Who makes those judgments? I, I, would, I would venture to say, you make those judgments. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to totally sort of destroy uh, classic theology. But I think that the Rambam allows us to move. That's the secret in the Rambam. Rambam says, get off this fear of reward and punishment. That's a level of devotion that sees relationship to God in contingent terms, in terms of dependency. I worship God because I expect the reward. This is, unfortunately, what I would say is classic religion. It's not just Judaism. I mean, right? Judaism has it. It's Christianity has it. Maybe they have a big time. You know, Islam has it. And in fact, you, you devote yourself religiously in order to be able to benefit from the showering of God's reward and avoiding, and, and avoiding the fear of punishment. The Rambam, the, the, all, the, the last chapter in the Laws of Tshuva, chapter 10, which I, you can read it in English. I recommend that you print it out and read it carefully. The Rambam says that religious life and religious education is a, is a process through which you, you need to be moved by your teachers from a dependent, contingent relationship of fear, avodah meira, to avodah me ahava, to worship, to devotion, to relationship for its own sake, like the love between a man and a woman, he says. In other words, the love between a man and a woman is not because you're a, uh, you're a partner with benefits. I, I, I don't know what the phrase is. They use that today. It's not about benefits. It's about the ide an ideal. I'm devoted out of love, and I'm ready to do anything, by the way. I'm, anything. I'm ready to do what, it, what needs to be done, even if it costs me, because I understand in principle that this is right. I don't do religion because somehow God's going to reward me. I need to get to the point of doing religion because I understand that there's something right about the religious way and that it provides me with a framework and principles that prod me to go deeper into myself and into the world and, and to others. Because it drives me in the direction that, other, that, he, that otherwise I wouldn't necessarily take myself in that direction. So there is a benefit. But the benefit is a principled benefit, a virtuous benefit, not a material benefit, not something that I'm doing because it's going to bring me, you know, whatever, uh, rewards. The reward is the goodness itself, right? As if you know the famous teaching, mitzvah goreret mitzvah, or schar mitzvah mitzvah. The reward for mitzvah is a mitzvah. Right, that's the point. Not that the reward for mitzvah is some, you know, some 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 goody. So Rosh Hashanah, rather than being a Yom Hadin, the day a day of judgment, Rosh Hashanah is a day that intended to be a symbol of the fact that we need to do this judgment all year long. And we have one day a year to focus on a lesson, to understand how we might engage in doing so in normal times. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are set aside in an abnormal environment where we are totally devoted to this form of exercise. And there are very few digressions or diversions. So the, the question is, how can we translate the inner process that the shofar brings us to an understanding and the consciousness of Rosh Hashanah to our daily interactions when there are so many digressions? That's the general question of how we meditate. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's the sort of the spiritual question that people have to confront. So Rosh Hashanah as a, and Yom Kippur as days of spirituality 
put us face to face with this idea of how to translate spirituality into a, a daily discipline. And we can do so in pieces. We can't do it all, all at once. So I'm going to, I'm going to come to a conclusion if there are any, maybe now if someone has a, if you have a question at this point, I'll stop here again and then we're going to, and then I'll, I'll lead us into the concluding, into the concluding section. Okay, so any, any, any questions, please. Okay. I'm trying to unmute Bachi. Hold on. It's not letting me. Bachi, can you try? Can't you un? Yeah, Can't sometimes you it just doesn't let me. I, it's uh -huh. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let, let me let me let me say something. We 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 get a sense of the basic principles that Rosh Hashanah is introduce, interested in inducing, not just from the shofar, but from the prayer service itself. Because the emphasis in each one of the prayer services, uh, we repeat this again and again, listen to the language. Ve'yasu kulam aguda achat. They'll all become a unity. One, one, uh, uh, oy, aguda. One united front, one front. The takein olam ni'alenu, which we recite again and again on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The takein olam, that's where it comes from. Tikkun olam, my friends. The takein olam b'malchut shaddai, in the kingdom of heaven, with a sense of with a sense of uh, uh, of of yirah, of fear, but not not fear of punishment. A type of awe, with a sense of awe, with with an awesome sense that we have, that we are standing on the precipice of transforming of transformation, and that we have this capacity to bring about uh, greater unity in the world. In other words, the the uh, it, it's fantastic when you think about it that these days that we think that we are taught to see, and, and I think in a very small notion it's about whether we're going to live or die not as well not so small but all about me all about me it's not all about me my reparation my repairing myself is part of a cosmic drama of people all people all over who need to repair themselves because in that process of reparation we can bring about a transformation and a redemptive uh, a redemption of humanity so here we see that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur push us beyond ourself, beyond even just our people, concerned just for Jews, to concern for humanity. I mean, that's, that's the declaration that we make, you know, at the, end, at the end of Yom Kippur, that God is one. That's what, it seems to me, that's, that's where we're headed. Now, the last two texts, and we'll come to a conclusion. This is, again, a Hebrew, we're not going to read it at all, but it was interesting to me when I came across it, of Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, I've mentioned him before, he was the head of the yeshiva in Volozhin, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, the yeshiva closed in 1892, but it was a great academy. Rabbi Cook, the first chief rabbi, studied there. Chaim Nachman Bialik, the poet laureate of Israel, studied there, and, and many other great writers and figures and, 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 and intelligent people uh, studied in this in this academy, and and the tziv was the head of the academy for sixty years. So in his commentary on the Torah, he mentions that there are three different types of prayer. He and it, it's interesting that people bring with them on on uh, on 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 Rosh Hashanah. Uh, there there is there is the person who is a lover of God, right? That's the virtuous person who does uh, who's reached a state. Uh, of un, uh, an uncontingent relationship, not dependent, not dependent on reward, and does things for their own sake. There's the Ohev Ha'am, there's a person who loves the people and who gets involved in prayer because it's good for the community, right? That's a dimension of prayer for sure. And then there is the person who does it, Mitzvah Tana Mada, who does it mechanically. And he prays because you have to pray. What's fantastic about this is that Rabbi uh, Rabbi Berlin includes them all in the community. That's what I think. That's what we. I. 
That's what I think we have to derive from the Rambam. The fact that the Rambam does nowhere rejects the behavior, the mythological behavior, but only hints that we have to go beyond the mythological behavior is his way of being inclusive. It's clear that he prefers one over the other. But he's not such an elitist that he demands that there's only one way and rejects the behavior of the community. That, that's such a compassionate approach. And the understanding is psychological. Because only if you give people an opportunity to counter what's real can they possibly move from their uh, deficient understanding to a more wholesome understanding. So if you merely reject, you get nothing and you lose them. So you have to be a good educator. And in being a good educator, the system includes religious behavior that's not preferable. In the hope that you can move from the, un from the not preferable to the preferable and, to the, and then to the ideal. And the Nitziv in the same manner presents this. So I, 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 want, I, I want you to see that's the community that we bring together. People with different desires, different needs, different inclinations. And that's one of the advantages of praying in a community. That, you know, we don't get to determine on our own to be sort of self-fulfilling. Self we need to be able to live socially with others who are not all like us. So this is how Rabbi Cook formulated it. And this is, this is magnificent. It's called the fourfold, the fourfold Song. We'll read it in English, only in English. So you know Rabbi Cook was the first chief rabbi. He was a mystic. He was a halachist. I mean, he, uh, he was a poet. And we have, we, have, uh, we have a lot of his religious poetry. Not only do we have his religious poetry, we have his religious diaries. And when his diaries... And, and when his diaries were discovered, because the books that were published were published by his son, and the son censored the writings, because he didn't want to reveal everything about his father. Because in the religious diaries, Rabbi Cook records his prophetic experiences. I mean, he was a spiritual personality, and he had an inclusive, you know that he went, he went on a tour of all the kibbutzim in the early 20th century, and he danced with the kibbutzniks even though they were not religious. And in the kibbutzim, they, there was a sort of a, a, memor, a, a, rem, a, a memorialization of Rabbi Cook's visit, because in some of these second kibbutzim, they had one little corner of the kitchen where they cooked kosher food because Rabbi Cook had visited them, and then he'll come again, which he did. He, he went more than once. So that's the way you bring people in, with love, with love, not with judgment. Let them judge themselves. You extend love to them. So he writes as follows. There is a person who sings the song of his soul, the individual. He finds everything as complete spiritual satisfaction within his soul. There is a person who sings the song of the nation. He's a nationalist and he sees something holy about the people. He steps forward from his private soul, which he finds and he prays for the good of the community. He finds narrow and uncivilized, he yearns for the heights. He clings with a sensitive love to the entirety of the Jewish nation and sings its song. He sings Hatikvah. He shares in its pains, is joyful in its hopes, speaks with exalted and pure thoughts regarding its past and its future, investigates its inner spiritual nature with love and a wise heart. There is a person whose soul is so broad that it expands beyond the border of Israel. It sings the song of humanity. This is clearly a heightened level. Now, listen to how he constructs it. This is the chief rabbi. The chief rabbi says the higher level then the song of Israel is a song of humanity. This soul constantly grows broader with the exalted totality of humanity and its glorious image. He yearns for humanity's general enlightenment. He looks forward to its supernal perfection. From this source of life, he draws all of his thoughts and insights, his ideals and visions. These are the, pr the principles are universal. That's where we're going, not just particular. That's what we're looking for. And that's what Rosh Hashanah and Kippur push us in a universal direction. And there is a person who rises even higher until he unites with all existence, with all creatures, with the natural world, with all worlds. And with all of them, he sings. There's a song of the universe, right? There's a, a, a composition that appears 
at the introduction to a lot of small little prayer books called Perak Shira, a chapter of song. These are songs where every element, every creation, every animal, every tree, every, every plant sings a song of devotion and, and exaltation, the awesome nature of the world. And so this is what's happening. You need the, the highest level is to be able to join in the rhythms of nature in singing nature's natural song to the universe. This is the person who engaged in the chapter of song every day is assured that he is a child of the world to come. And beyond this, there is a person who rises with all these songs together in one ensemble so that they all give forth their voices. They all sing their songs sweetly. Each supplies its fellow with fullness and life, the voice of happiness and joy, the voice of rejoicing and tunefulness, the voice of merriment and the voice of holiness, the song of the soul, the song of the nation, the song of humanity, the song of the world. They all mix together with this person at every moment and at all times. This is a state of otherworldliness. We can reach this state in moments in our life. It's impossible to sustain a type of, of concentration and devotion at this level. You understand that? This is something that we aspire to. The aspiration is to reach some, some transcendence. In that moment of transcendence, you could say you touch God, whatever, the, the wholeness of being. But you can't remain in the wholeness of being and remain a human being. Because if you remain in the wholeness of being, you cease to be human. So it's only momentary that the spiritual personality can attain this sense of oneness. But we aspire to that oneness. That's what he means here. And this simplicity, they all mix together. And this simplicity in its fullness rises to become a song of holiness. The song of God, the song that is simple, double, tripled, and quadrupled. Quadrupled, the four-letter name of God, yud hey vav hey. This is, a, this is a poem based on the notion that God's name itself carries the secret of God's oneness that we have to embody in our religious lives. The song of songs of Solomon, of the king who is characterized by completeness. Shlomo, melech shehashalom shalom, shleimut, wholeness and peace and shalom. May this year bring you wholeness, peace, and health to all of you. Take care of yourselves, and we'll continue to learn next week. Shalom, shalom. Be well, all of you. The Song of the Universe is Rabbi Cook. Okay. Now we can all be unmuted and say hello to one another. Thank you so much. This was really fabulous. Thank you so much, Chaim. It's Fred. It was wonderful. Thank you, Chaim. That was so beautiful and so meaningful. Thank you. What a beautiful Thank way to start the High Holy Days. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Ah, shalom. <laughs> shalom, shalom. It's good to see you. Good to see good you. Too. Ah, how's the family? Everyone okay? Yeah, they're uh, right here. <laughs> Give me my best. Give Seppi. Hi, Seppi. How you doing? Seppi, Rabbi Chaim is saying hi. Shana Shavah. Thank you, Rabbi. Santa Barbara's okay. Everyone's okay. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. Well, we'll see you next week, hopefully. Oh, it's Ravid. Ravid, yeah. Hi, Ravid. Shalom. Ah, shalom uvracha. Shana Tova. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Chaim. It's bedtime on the other coast. Thank you, Fred. Okay, take care. Where, where are you going to be, Fred? You're going to be in a, in, in, in you're going to uh, uh, Hadar, uh, not Hadar. Uh, no, I'll, I'll actually be in Newton uh, ah. with my daughter. So we'll do BJ and uh, ah. Dorshe Tzedek, ah. kind of, yeah. on each two ah. is in her own computer. So. Okay, all right. All right, good to see you, my best of Doreen. Thank and you. see you next week, looking forward. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Chaim. That was really, really outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice time. My... Well, God, Dennis, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, I, I take that seriously. Thank you. How's, thank you. How's, how's the book that I didn't uh, comment on? How's the book? I, I'm making progress. Uh... All, right, all right. So, you know what? Uh, after Yantaf, let's, let's reconnect. Absolutely. I'm sitting at home. You see, I'm sitting in my library for the first time in years. And my uh, mind is beginning to look like that. Okay, good. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not your office? It looks like your office. <laughs> no, this is this is my home, and and it was clear. My son helped me clear. This is clear. You know, the rest of the the rest of the library is very clear. It's it, there are no paws on the floor. Hi, uh, hi, Drew. I'm, I'm if you remember me, I'm uh, Erechim's 
uh, brother. Yes, brother. Yes, yes, and of course. Now I, now I understand um, uh, where Eric gets a lot of his passion. He gets it from you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He has it. He has his own. He has internal passion. He has passion in your family. That's yeah, but he picked up. I now see he's picked up some mannerisms. He he obviously um, views you as a mentor, and he's picked, you know I know my brother very well, and he's picked up a lot of his passion for uh -huh. Judaism and the way he expresses himself from you. So I I really you. enjoyed this. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Thank you. Your blessing. I'm. Ah, shalom. Shalom. I'll see. I'll see you next week. All right, I'm sure I'll see you. Both of you are well? You, you both well? Sham, yes. Okay, good, good, okay, good. Right, wait, who's it? Who's Joan? Ah, ah, hi, ah, Joan. Hi, I was wondering, okay. All right, I know. Good, and, 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 and here's Bashi, and, and, and Marvin and Mimi. Hey, Jan, I saw Jan a minute ago. Is Jan still on? Or? <laughs> Can I talk to you? We'll see you next week. All right, I'm I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out. Okay, we're leaving now. <laughs> Take, Take care. Leave. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Chaim. Oh. Ah, shalom, shalom. Thanks a lot, Chaim. Very nice job. Um, nice job.